Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of people out there. There's thousands of people there. Yeah. Um, and you worked at Nike. Huh? Um, your cousin worked at Nike. Mm-hmm. Or that's what he said. Uh, <laughs> Did I misunderstand? Maybe. 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 Because I'm the only out of the school work at Nike. Okay. And my dad's friend. Your dad's friend? Yeah, that's yeah, cool. That's a little way before two. Yeah. Okay, maybe uh, we can start already. Sound check. There you go. Very good. <laughs> All right. Good Hello. Good morning. So welcome, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. This is our uh, fourth. Uh, time or series of recollection here at the Grotto during this Lenten season. All right. So we already finished the three. I don't know if you followed it online, <laughs> but this is the fourth um, series of our free recollection. Anyone can access to it via online or in person, like here and now. So before we start, we first begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Lord our God and loving Father, we thank you for this new day, for this new life. As we begin this series of recollection today, come to our gathering, send forth your Holy Spirit to strengthen us, to inspire us, to guide us in this deepening of our faith, in our knowledge of Jesus, and our commitment of service as his disciples in this present age continue always to abide with us, to guide us and uh, strengthen us in this particular journey of our Christian faith. All this we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So welcome, my dear brothers and sisters. I'm Father Edgar, for those who don't know me yet, uh, a Filipino prior. So this is our fourth, as I said, fourth series of uh, our Lenten recollection. And the theme for today's uh, recollection is about the washing of the feet, foundation of Christian service. So we are so familiar of this gospel or this theme actually during Thursday, Holy Thursday evening, the Last Supper meal or Mass where you usually witness the traditional um, symbol or yeah um, of Christian service or that what we call reenactment okay of the washing of the feet of Jesus um, before the meal while also reenacted by the priest during the mass on last supper every holy thursday of the holy week now we will try to uh, dig deeper or enter into that scenario. I don't know if you familiar of the gospel text. It's better for you to read it. The gospel passage about the washing of the feet. And I think that's uh, John, no? That's um, the gospel of John. Foundation, as I said, of Christian service. So we need to say, my dear brothers and sisters, whenever we encounter or we witness this kind of symbol of Christian service, like the washing of the feet, it reminds us of the very foundation of our service. Service in the family, at school, in the office, or anything that should be 
the very source or the very inspiration where we always draw our act of service. Why we need to serve as the Lord serves his disciples. Now, we proceed. This particular passage in the Gospel of St. John reminds us that washing of the feet reminds us of the final evening of Jesus. So this is the last moment, last encounter, last meeting, last gathering. Why? Because after this, there will be uh, an event that would challenge would even challenge the discipleship, the faithfulness of the disciples, when the Lord will be arrested. So this is practically the last get-together of Jesus with his disciples. That's why this is very, very important in the Gospel of John. There are two elements in this final meeting or encounter or final meal together, because afterwards we will be separated from each other for a lifetime. So this must be so important, if not so grandeur kind of celebration, if we try to put it in the context of human gathering. Because afterwards, we will be, you know, parting from each other, uh, pursue, pursue our own goals or uh, ambitions in life. So we need to make it more meaningful and really uh, fruitful and Joyful, okay? But in the context of the Lord, this is not just about human gathering. There is something to do with the element that the disciples later on would also imitate, like us, especially to, to young people. That you are trained, you know, like us, of course, not fully and perfectly trained and executing what we have learned, but we are always trying to draw from that, you know, inspiration so that we can truly improve our way of serving as an expression of our love and concern. So first element of this final evening of Jesus with his disciples, always remember when, whenever we celebrate Holy Thursday, washing of the feet, it reminds us of the final association or final moment of Jesus with his disciples before he will be arrested. Jesus administered the menial, the very lowest, when we say menial, the lowest or the humblest kind of work done by a slave, not just by a manager, <laughs> but a slave. Because we are talking in the context of the Hebrew culture. Not American, not Filipino, not Mexican, but Hebrew. All right? The menial service of washing the disciples' feet. Jesus washed the feet of his disciples, not the disciples washed the feet of Jesus. Meaning to say, it's your mother who wash your feet, or your president who wash your feet, something like that. Okay? And then the second element is, aside from that, Jesus' farewell discourse. Meaning to say his, his speech in that sense, or his uh, instructions to his disciples before he will be arrested. So two elements here, the washing of the feet and the Farewell discourse. Of course, before, humanly speaking again, before this final gathering, uh, before we part from each other, there will be, of course, everyone would speak up, no? I don't know, parting message, whatever, right? During the end of, for example, of academic year, <laughs> you will say, okay, during this vacation, I will do this, and good luck to all of you, something like that. The same thing happens in this particular scenario. Farewell discourse. Of course, it was Jesus who made a message, not the disciples. They just listened to him. 
carefully what Jesus would say. Two key words in this particular event. First is the hour of Jesus. So the hour of Jesus, meaning to say, he will be arrested or he will suffer, persecuted, trialed, and then put to death. This is the word, the hour, no? And this at the same time, within this, there is what we call the hour of his departing, as we mentioned, and the hour of the love that reaches to the end. That's why I try to make simplify it because this is quite uh, theological, very academic. The word agape, the highest form of love. There is what we call degrees, right? Degrees. Good, better, best. Like uh, superlative in English. No? There is even in, in, in terms of like, um, um, you grade it. 10, 9, no, 5, 6, 7, 8. You grading. So there is degree. So there is also degree of love. Less, okay, lesser, greater, or the best expression of love. And in Greek language or words, there are actually three levels of love. Eros, philia, and agape. Okay? Because in English, there is only one word of love. One word to that, love. No more. Do you have, do you have still other word for love? <laughs> so that sometimes the limitation of other language, because in some other language, it has um, different kind of various meanings or even words, while in some other language, it has only one word. That's why if you try to de define love in English, you cannot find other words but only love. I love chicken, I love watching, I love sleeping, I love eating, I love God. So somehow you cannot differentiate between love eating and love God. <laughs> Unlike when you uh, use the, the word love in, in Greek, there is first level, the eros, uh, the, the, um, uh, yeah, the eros, love of, you know, attractiveness to the good, being drawn to the beautiful. What is beautiful, you are always attracted to it. You will not be attracted to something ugly, of course. You are only attracted to something that is good and appealing. And anything that is appealing is always good, at least according to the subjective perspective. Because maybe what is good to me, beautiful to me, is not exactly the same. How do you look at it? All right? But at least with regards to attractiveness, there is always goodness in it. The, and the second, I think it's a philia, love of friendship. It's a friendship, it's love of humanity, love of everyone, the philia. Okay? While Agape, as the supreme expression of love, is that is selfless love. That is agape. That's why you, you are even ready, like what Jesus said, no greater love than this to offer one's life for one's friend. That is agape. That you are ready to sacrifice yourself for the sake of another. That is agape. Fullness of love. Alright? So this is exactly the first part or the second uh, with regards to the hour of Jesus. The hour of the love that reaches to the end. Why? Aside from washing, he will later on prove to his disciples that he is ready to die for them. That's why it is agape. Okay? So the hour as defined here, well, uh, actually, I got this source, most of it, from Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, from his book. And then some are from his contemporary, uh, Von Balthasar. They are all great theologians. But of course, Benedict is not just a theologian, but he was a uh, Pope Emeritus, our former Pope, Pope before Pope Francis. Alright? So he said that love is the very process of passing over 
of transformation, of stepping outside, take note of the movement, stepping outside, outside from the comfort zone of someone's comfort zone or boundary. All right? So, stepping outside the limitations of the fallen humanity, we are all separated from one another and ultimately impenetrable to one another into an infinite otherness. That's how Jesus entered in. When we are no longer connected to each other and almost impossible for us to be united, to meet or to be reconciled, the Lord entered in between to reconcile us, to unite us once again. That, that, that mentality today of being indifferent, just, you know, concerned of oneself, and then you don't care about other people, that's indifference, no? Who cares? What, only, what I only care is about myself. So the Lord came in and trying to call and invite everyone to come together again. Knowing that in our world today, even you young people exactly notice what is going on in the world. That the indifference attitude of indifference is to the increase. Okay? But here the Lord, His love is trying to penetrate to that infinite otherness. Trying to, recon to reconcile those two persons who been separated because of selfishness or cruelty or quarrel or hatred. The Lord came in to reconcile these two persons. Okay? In that case. And that is the expression of His love. So love to the end. What does it mean to love to the end? Our love has a limit, right? That's why we mentioned a while ago about the beyond the limit or the boundary. When you feel that you are no longer comfortable, you don't risk yourself, right? You help us um, as long as you feel good. You feel better. But there are moments that Sometimes, it requires us to get out from our comfort zone. Comfortable time, I don't know, comfortable situation, our resources, or the leftover, or the surplus. But we cannot touch the one that we really reserve for ourselves, right? Okay? But here, this love manifested by Jesus jump into the limit of his, you know, of his God, of his being. God who is supposed to be up there, like sitting on the throne and just, you know, commanding, okay, do this, do that, don't do that, do this, something like that, no? Like, like in the church, no? Uh, maybe one of the complaints of young people, and of course, all, most of us is, when the church is always saying no, don't. <laughs> Otherwise, you go to hell. <laughs> right? <laughs> and I can, I can feel you <laughs> that once upon a time, that's also my complaint. Why in the church, why my faith as a Catholic would always like somehow curtail my freedom? Would somehow, would always uh, limit me or control me? Hmm. Is God really controlling? Is our faith really controlling us? I don't think so. Alright? So, love to the end is what brings about the seemingly impossible metabasis. That is, stepping outside the limits of one's close individuality. Quite uh, deep no? <laughs> individuality. Which is what agape is. Breaking through into the divine. So we need to say, my dear brothers and sisters, the coming of Jesus, the expression of His love, penetrated into that otherness, into that space that we created to divide us because we don't want to mingle with, with each other. We don't want to, to interfere with each other's affair. <laughs> 
So the Lord tried to remove that stumbling block or that space that we created because we wanted to be on our own. And His love is being is the one that somehow removed that stumbling block, that distance, that that space of being separated, for us to be united once again. That's why the expression of washing of the faith is exactly leading us to that idea. All right. So the hour of Jesus is the great stepping beyond the hour of transformation. Whenever we try to enter into this scenario of washing of the feet, my dear brothers and sisters, later on it will remind us that indeed it's not just like a simple kind of thing that you know would would impress others. Well, father was the feet of of my father, for example, no. If if your father happened to be one of the disciples, no, to being chosen, but they, they will be their feet will be washed on Holy Thursday. Okay, and that's, that's why you, you even take the video. <laughs> it's a nice thing, no? And you post it on Facebook. Oh, my father was uh, one of the uh, 12 disciples chosen in our parish, and uh, our pastor was his feet. <laughs> Something like that. But it's not just simply as symbolic. Okay? So, the agape, the fullness of love, the total love, okay? To the end, and here, here, since Saint John is our gospel uh, reference for this uh, washing of the feet, anticipates the final word of the dying Jesus. It is finished. So it also like makes us eventually conclude that after the washing of the feet, that's the end also of the final manifestation of the love of Jesus by washing the feet of his disciples. That's why the words of Jesus there on the cross resonates or echoes that event on the Last Supper, the washing of the feet. Though he, he, he said it when he was already about to die on the cross, it is finished. Okay? So this end, this totality of the self-giving, again, another term, Totality, not just 50-50, not just 70%, not just 90%, but 100% of the self-giving. When you say self-giving, you don't just give all your resources. You don't just give your talents and just your energies, but even your very life. <laughs> That's why total. Because sometimes our service, our love, uh, like... For the children, um, doing responsibility in the family, you just give, you know, what what your parents ask you to do, like wash the dishes. That's the only thing. And sometimes it's even against our will. <laughs> because you rather prefer to, you know, <laughs> to do like that instead of <laughs> cleaning and everything. <laughs> okay. And of course, we've been through that, right? We've been through that. Now that's your struggle. <laughs> We've been there a long time ago. <laughs> but it doesn't mean that you should, you know, we, we should like uh, scold you to the point that we've never been to that kind of struggle or difficulty. What I can tell you is just listen to your elders and try your best to be responsible each day that you don't uh, allow the day to pass without doing anything good. Uh, just Wasting your time, whatever, to oh, so, so nothing, okay? So, the totality of the self-giving, of remolding the whole of being, this is what it means to give oneself even unto death. So, this is quite deep, of course. Um, later on, we will understand this, but for us adult, we already have this idea of Total self-giving, especially for parents. Young, when when their children, for example, get sick, right? They even like wish na how do you wish that the sickness will transfer to them? Because they don't want their children to be the one to suffer like headaches, like pain, whatsoever. 
So their their parents normal language na can, is, is it possible that the sickness that my child bears could be transferred to me? Now, that's one of the human expression of what we call total self love or self giving. Okay. So Jesus coming to humanity and his return to the Father. So remember, we know that Jesus is a historical person. He existed in history in a certain period of time. And we can know that if we try to know the, the history of the Roman emperors, you know, historically speaking. And in that sense, he was born. And so he, the word exitus or exit and return. He came to humanity in that sense. He left his father's presence in order to meet us, in order to get us back, in order to encounter us physically and personally. So in that sense, he momentarily left the home or left his father in heaven. That's why there is an exodus. And this time, in this particular moment, it is also a gesture of a return. Going back to the Father. To this eternal home we call. Because we know that our home here on earth is just like a journey. Momentary home. Because no one lives forever here, no? <laughs> we cannot... Uh, um, Trace someone who lived for, for example, 100 years or uh, 100 years, yes, 200 years, no. <laughs> okay, so there you go. The gesture of washing of feet express precisely this it is the servant love of Jesus. Servant love. Of course, for us, it is unthinkable. That a master or God will wash your feet. Knowing that in our mentality in the world, it is the work of the servant. It is the work of the servant. Why your master or your boss wash your feet? What does it mean? Or the, in this case, God wash your feet. Hmm? That, that's unthinkable. That's why. No God in history ever did that to a human being, but only the God of the Christian. Meaning, your God, your God and my God. Never. Because usually, the concept of God and, and man, man is the slave. He or she must serve the needs of the God so that the God will provide his request. That's always the idea from ancient times. So you have to please the God so that he will grant your prayer. Basically. But here, this kind of God is different. He was even the one who served the needs so much so that the, the human being becomes the God's while God becomes human being, or like a, ser a slave. What does it mean? Again, we go back to that idea of the love. The love of this God. Meaning to say, God is ready to die for you. <laughs> Amazing, right? Where can you find a God who is ready to die for you? Only the Christian God. Don't you realize that? Sometimes you are just thinking, God died. You don't even realize that He actually died for you. Because He loves you. No one would offer one's life to someone whom He doesn't love. Like for example, your friends, no? If you don't lo love your friend, you don't listen to whatever he needs. You don't help the person. You only help the person whom you care. So therefore, if God dies for you, he, all, he, he, he more than cares about us. He actually loves us. 
because only one capable of offering one's life if that person deserves it because he loves the person. So meaning to say, my dear brothers and sisters, the way of Jesus, like washing of the feet, is one of the manifestations of his care and love to each one of us. Aside from later on, his dying on the cross. That's another maybe topic that we can talk about uh, next Saturday. Another interesting topic. And what is that? Spectators on and above the cross. Oh, I like that. Spectators. <laughs> I like the topic, no? It's not, it was uh, uh, another one as inspired by Archbishop Photon Shin. He's an American Archbishop, actually. Anyway, if you're familiar with him, you can see him, you can watch him on YouTube. He used to like uh, give a talk uh, in the television or radio. That is like a ministry. So he used that theme, spectators on and above the cross. Another interesting topic next Saturday. <laughs> All right. So for the meantime, we are talking about the washing of the feet. All right. So the second, after that, what we call the hour. Why hour? Because this is the last time, the last meeting, the last meal of Jesus with his disciples. So there must be uh, a memorable gesture or even um, a basic principle where they can be they can use as as basis of their actions before they depart from each other okay so this mom this particular scenario is about when of course i can relate i think all of us can relate to the reaction of peter when jesus approached peter and about to wash his feet right he refused you want to wash my feet? I should be the one to wash your feet. And that is logically correct. Okay, so Peter refused Jesus, the offer of Jesus to wash his feet. Okay, because in his understanding, it is not the master who wash, who should wash the, the feet of his servant. But it's the servant who washed the feet of the master. Basic understanding. Our common understanding. But here, it's the opposite. It's the total reversal of our belief, of our common understanding. That's why we call it like a 180 degrees of reverse. If you're familiar with that, I don't know, uh, in mathematics, what's, what's that measurement thing? I am not that anymore <laughs> familiar with that I don't know, roller and whatever <laughs> instrument, no? 180 degrees, we call it, no? So if man is to enter God's presence, he has he have to fellowship with God, he must be clean, yet the more he moves into the light, the more he senses how defiled he is, how much he stands in need of cleanliness, cleaning, of cleansing. One of the many reactions and experience of people who are trying to, to practice their faith, actually, especially those who already like been from sinfulness and then try to undergo conversion, you know, uh, they try to go back to the church, for example, Along the way, they, they have this struggle or the difficulty to continue because as they get closer, they notice that they experience some kind of unworthiness, which is very, very uh, normal feeling. Now, you don't feel deserved and worthy of the Lord. Because, of course, of guilt, of sin in the past, for example, or the ongoing sin that you find it so hard to totally remove or left behind. And so the tendency is they rather stop or withdraw, return to the old, uh, former way of life. Because of that shame 
and guilt and being so unworthy of the grace of God. Well, in fact, that is positive on the other hand, but on the one hand, we have to all the more persevere because it is only the way for us to be totally purified and cleansed. That's why, it, you know, my dear brothers and sisters, personally, uh, if I only deal with my sinfulness as a person, of course, though I am a priest, but at the end of the day, I, I remain a person like any one of you who still uh, step on the same ground and it's, you know, exposed to ordinary, you know, temptations or tendencies. If I only, you know, focus on that weakness, maybe I already give up my priesthood a long time ago. Because I can really feel that I don't deserve God's love and even this ministry. I even sometimes think there is even someone else who is worthy of this. But why anyway God chose me? Though I am perhaps the weakest among men. But the point here is I don't rely on my strength, but rather I depend on the grace of the Lord. Because for sure, if I will not rely on God's grace, I will never be a better person or a credible priest because of the grace of God. Not because of my capacity, not because of my education, not because of my talent, no. So therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, only when we humble ourselves, that's why the word perseverance is very, very important, that in the midst of suffering, in the midst of difficulties, in the midst of our struggle, uh, in our sinfulness, we need to persevere, meaning to say, to continue. Because anyway, the Lord who called you will never abandon you anyway. Now from the very start, He knows that you are weak. From the very start, because before you could ever imagine, because you could even realize it, that you are weak. The Lord knows it already. So there is no need for you to, to, to hide yourself, because anyway, God knows me from the very start. But the only thing that the Lord asks from us is our total surrender, that's why the importance of humility. Humility, my friend, not pride. People who, you know, who give up the faith, try to see. There is an element of pride in these people. Pride is the obstacle to be cleansed. Why Peter refused to be wash to wash his, his feet. Aside from that, you know, wrong mentality, he has this, you know, this pride that, no, it's me that must clean your, your feet, Lord. No. That uh, wrong understanding. Sometimes, though we believe in the Lord, though we are Christians, in, but in fact, our understanding of our faith is actually wrong. That can happen. Peter was some disciples of Jesus. Actually, almost all of them have a wrong understanding of the of the of the coming of Jesus. They thought that Jesus was a political savior. But his kingdom is not the White House. <laughs> if we try to put it in the context of America, his seat is not the White House. His kingdom is in heaven, not the kingdom on earth. Okay? So, so if you notice, in every religion, there is always an element of you know, purifying rites, right? Think. There is always uh, a customary way, or a puri purifying rite, uh, that always, you know, every member has to undergo the process. Whether it is a ritual of washing the hands or, or 
uh, emerging to the water, for example. That's why there are two ways of, you know, in baptismal rites, no? Baptism, two, two ways. The traditional one and the, the new one, the, the simple one, pouring on the foreheads three times. Well, the biblical one, the traditional, which is still being preserved uh, as a first option. That's why I think here, I notice uh, many of the parishes has this kind of like bathtub. No, bathtub. No? Because literally, maybe the baby, they will really immerse no? something like that. <laughs> or the adult one. Because, you know, you know exactly the, the logic of, you know, immersion to the water. That's why when you swim in the swimming pool or in the sea, when you, when you immerse yourself, meaning to say, because you feel dirty, when you get out from the water, it's a logic, it's you are fresh. That all the dirt uh, is removed from you. So in that sense, this is always a ritual purification rite. In every religion, I believe, no? If they don't have that kind of thing, I don't know. But here, like in Christianity, so religions have therefore created the system of purification intended to make it possible for man to approach God. Because that's the only way for us in that sense to be purified and to be cleansed. That's why, that's why before you become a Christian, you have to undergo the first sacrament, baptism. And what is that? To, to be cleansed from original sin. If you are adult, no, uh, catechumens, both original and personal. But for a baby, it's just the original. Because the baby did not get sin. Okay? But if it's an adult, it is both. The personal sin and the original sin. So that is a rite of purification. So there's always that right. That's why the washing of the feet actually reminds us of that element. That they will never be pleasing and clean before that supper. Because, you know, when, when, we, when you hear a story in the gospel about meal, it has always an element of Eucharistic tune. Meaning to say, you cannot separate always the element of the Holy Mass there. Whenever, whenever there is what we call meal, suffering or uh, supper or gathering of the disciples with Jesus, it is always no. It has always an element, according to skip, uh, scholars, biblical scholars. There is always an element of Eucharistic celebration there. That's why, if you notice in the mass before we start, there is what is that? After in the name of the Father, and then the Lord be with you. And what's the part? Recognizing of one sinfulness. Through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault, or the other short one, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. Because we will not be, you know, worthy enough to receive the Eucharist. Unless we first cleanse ourselves, unless we first recognize and somehow wash our sins. So you get even that mass. There are still a lot of things there that we we still don't understand. But we are just doing it. But eventually, as you discover every part, ah, it makes sense actually. That it's like before you go to the table, you have to wash your hands first. Isn't it? <laughs> I mean, in, in a typical eating in the house, in the restaurant, basically, of course, basically, we wash our hands. The same thing in the Mass. Though it's not literal washing of the hands, but it's washing of conscience. That's why we admit no, our sinfulness and we ask pardon, like forgiveness from the Lord, so that we can proceed to the following rites until we come to the point of receiving Jesus in the Eucharist. Hmm. So overwhelming and so rich in meaning, you know, my dear brothers and sisters. And so there is an element of washing, of cleansing, meaning of renouncing our sins. Because without recognizing it as if 
We don't deserve. We are not worthy to receive the Lord. His body and blood. But unless with humility, with contrite heart and humble spirit, we will truly be worthy to receive Him. Alright? So that's the gesture of the, um, the washing of the feet, one of the elements. What or who makes our heart clean? Oh, there, this is the question. Well, it's me, Father. <laughs> For those who are, who are boasting and proud, well, I am the one who can, de who can determine whether I am clean or not. Mm. No. We cannot claim that. It's not our own doing. It's not our own effort that makes us clean. Mm. In front of the Lord, it is only the Lord who can declare that. It's not, oh Lord, I'm clean, huh? No, we cannot do that. I deserve to, to partake at the table because I'm clean. <laughs> no one can declare that but the Lord. Okay, no one can declare that but the Lord. Because He is the one who offers the, the process how to be worthy to partake His meal or His very body and blood. Not me, not just the, puri the purity alone, the ritual purity alone, not our own doing alone, okay? Though uh, there is part of it, no? Part of it, participation, not enough. That's why we say not enough. So therefore, to make it complete and even more primary, it is God's doing. And the person who hears and believes. Now, there you, get, there you go. You see now, hears, believes. This is very, very important. That those who partake, who attended the Mass, that's why those who are not Catholic are not supposed to receive the Eucharist. Because this, this is meant for believers. Would you like to eat something that you don't believe that it is safe? Of course not. By the way, would you go there if you are not, if you are not practicing, if you are not believing what they are doing? Of course not. Although sometimes they just join because for curiosity's curiosity sake, what they are doing, just curious. But it has nothing to do that you believe in it. You're just curious maybe because your friend invited you to go there. But maybe it starts with curiosity. And then eventually you try to study and research. Ah, that's why they are doing this because it is actually biblical. But first, for you to be in the company, you must be a hearer and primarily a believer. Meaning to say, you don't attend <coughs> to the celebration if you are not invited or if you are not part of the family. Exactly. That's why whenever we participate, we join in the Mass, we have to feel at home. Not feel at home that you do like that, no? <laughs> That when you are at home, really, that your, your feet even go to the other side. <laughs> That's not the feel at home we are talking about. I mean, feel at home that you always feel that God is here, that we gather together, though we don't know each other, but anyway, we gather together to worship our God. Because it's a family affair. Faith is a family affair. Not just shopping or uh, camping or hiking. <laughs> A family affair or friends affair. It is a family affair. That's why those who partake and who participate on the table, the last supper of Jesus, were believers. Believers, meaning disciples, not the Pharisees, not the scribes. Though they used to join Jesus, though they used to always, you know, have conflict. But in this Last Supper, those who were there were just disciples, meaning to say, believers and followers and hearers of the Lord. In some events, the crowd were there. But why during the Supper, only the disciples? Logic! Because they were called by the Lord and they followed the Lord. Why do you follow the Lord? Because they believe in the Lord. <laughs> That's why. 
those who hears and believes. Imagine after the public ministry, crowds from different regions or countries flock together and even almost trust Jesus because they always like after Jesus asking for healing, I don't know, whatever. But afterwards, who left? Who remains? The disciples. Did you take that? The world may abandon the Lord, but not his disciples. For a time, maybe they recognize Jesus, but at the end of the day, who remains? The disciples. That's why don't ever ever question why only few people, why only few Catholic continue to persevere to practice their faith, though the majority perhaps they altogether abandon it. Because they would say it's not practical. It's just a waste of time. What else? Mm. Religion? God? <laughs> Science matters. Science can bring us to the moon. <laughs> but not to heaven. Okay? You can explore to all the planets. You can explore to all the galaxies, perhaps. Spending billions of monies, wasting. But it cannot bring you to heaven. It cannot bring you to God. <laughs> That's why the, the pride of, of science sometimes is, wow. Anyway, that's the world. But be careful, my dear brothers and sisters. Sometimes science can even make us and leave us to disappointment. And sometimes in tragedy. Because, because of science, you know, uh, what achievement right now that science is uh, able to achieve? Biological weapon. Wow. It can wipe, eye, wipe out us in a blink of an eye. Congratulations, science. <laughs> we are so proud of it. Science created for a good reason, for a for a noble purpose, but sometimes because of abuse, it can even create havoc used for a wrong reason. There's nothing wrong with science, of course. It, it, it is created to, to explore the creation, the beauty of creation. But not to deny the creator supposed to be. Uh -huh. <laughs> Faith cleanses the heart. Okay, so meaning to say, faith matters, my dear brothers and sisters. Why is it difficult for someone to be convinced of the existence of God? No matter how, you know, file of evidence you will offer to the person. Because first and foremost, the person does not believe. If you do not believe, no matter how, for an unbeliever, file of evidence will never be enough to convince the person to believe. Because in the first place, he is, he is not a believer. So there is no enough evidence for the person to be convinced so that he will believe. But for someone who believes, sometimes there is no need for him for an evidence. Because to believe is enough. It is the result of God's initiative towards a person. You know, even our faith, my dear friends, it's a gift. It is God's gift to each one of us. How can I have a faith, Father? Maybe you start with pride. <laughs> Lower your pride. Maybe that's the start later on that you will eventually believe. But if you remain so proud, uh, forget it. So humility is the key. It is not simply a choice that man makes for themselves. Okay, so faith is not, well, it's part of it because you choose it. You receive it. It's like a gift. Now, when you are given a gift, 
you have the choice, the choices whether to receive, to accept it, or reject it. Because we as people, we, we are free. We have freedom. So meaning when we speak about freedom, it is the capacity to choose. It is the capacity to say no or yes. It is the capacity to reject or to accept. That's the beauty of freedom. Okay? So, faith comes about because men are touched deep within by God's Spirit who opens and purifies their hearts. So, it is always God's initiative. The only thing that we have to do is to always surrender ourselves to the Lord. To allow the Lord to have space in our lives. That's the only thing. It's just a kind of, okay, the Lord is just, I give you this, 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 I give you this. And the only thing that you have to do, receive, 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 receive. And then, of course, improve it. Nurture it. Or sometimes, bury it. <laughs> Or throw it away. Like that parable of what is that? The talents, if you know if you remember. There were three three servants, I think, given the talents. The last one buried the talent. He did not uh, use it to to earn more. So when the owner returned, he asked for the for his for his what we call uh, share. The last one did not uh, was afraid because he did not uh, risk it. He buried it rather because he was afraid. So it was taken away from him and it was thrown away. Something like that. Sometimes that happened. That can happen to us. Though the Lord has given us much, but sometimes whether we refuse it, we we though we accept it sometimes, but we just bury it or we put it in our closet or drawer. <laughs> Something like that. We don't improve it or nurture it. That's why it never in or increase. Sometimes faith can happen that way. Yes, we are baptized, right? How many Catholics in the United States? In the Philippines, we are majority Catholics. It's like 85 or yeah, 85 percent Catholics. But you know. Those who, who, who are practicing, just 10%. 10% out of 85%. Where are the majority? They're just there. <laughs> they just go to church like uh, seasonal, like uh, during Holy Thursday. If you happen to visit the Philippines, try to observe this. During Thursday, Holy Thursday, Holy Week, Evening, I think, starting in the afternoon, you can see almost like, wow, a lot of people walking. Young people going to uh, pilgrim like a uh, popular, uh, shall we say, church, like uh, a church that is always visited, you know, a pilgrim site. They walk by foot without a slipper because it's like their, how do you call this, uh, condition and belief. That if they will do this, they will receive their uh, their their prayers. They will be answered. They just they just go out on that day, and then afterwards, no more. <laughs> so it's it's a sad thing that though we are majority, but only few are practicing. I don't know. Some that's why we call there are three groups of Catholics. Where we can identify ourselves. Nominal, cafeteria, and practicing. <laughs> Nominal, they are just Catholic by name, no more. Uh, how would you know, Father, that they are Catholic? Look at their baptismal certificate, baptized as Catholic. That's it. That's it. That's, uh, that's all. The cafeteria, these are Catholic who only likes some of the practices of the Catholic Church. It's like when you go to a cafeteria, no? You don't buy all the products there. You only like your favorite flavor. <laughs> the same thing with, with Catholics who are 
on the group uh, belonging to the group of cafeteria catholic they only like some of the teachings of the church like they just like the holy mass but the rest of the teachings of the church they even like don't like it maybe they like they like this a part, this particular priest but the rest of the priest they don't like <laughs> something like that <laughs> so it's like cafeteria why you go to starbucks <laughs> because i like this particular flavor of their coffee but the rest of their product hmm. okay <laughs> something like that even in the church there are people there are catholics like that unfortunately and most probably or hope uh, hopefully not maybe one of the members of your friends or family or i don't know <laughs> that's the reality you know okay hopefully we are not we do not belong to that kind of group so jesus word is more than a word it is his very self aha uh -huh. take note sometimes we separate the word from the person speaking but in jesus both the word and jesus is one okay that's why we cannot find anything in his words that is against his action sometimes what we say is contrary to what we do that's why there is an inconsistency that we say this but we do the other way, the other thing so inconsistent but in the lord his words or his actions is the same that's why the scribes and the pharisees could not find anything to use against him <laughs> Exactly. They, fi they find it hard to find something to use against him because his action and his, his being is totally the same. How I wish, how we wish that we have a friend like that, no? That his, his person and his actions is just one, unison. And this is Jesus. His word is truth and it is love. You can feel na the word itself, you can already that there is, there is love there. Have you experienced that? That even the words spoken by the person, you can already feel the love. While on the other hand, the words alone, you already feel that the person is angry with you. <laughs> Something like that. Or doesn't like you by just listening to his words right <laughs> sometimes okay so the words of jesus actually is already enough that the lord loves you by listening to his words consoling words understanding words you can feel that indeed this this jesus is indeed a true friend mm -hmm. that's why the gesture of the washing of the feet by the gesture alone, you can see and you can prove and you can feel that he indeed loves you. By just being washed by Jesus, you feel that he loves you. Okay? So, it is a gift. The gift of purity, so the cleansing, the washing, or the baptism in, in, in our um in the in the church uh, the, one of the sacraments the gift of purity is an act of god again it is not our own it is god's initiative it is the god who comes down to us who makes us clean wow if you try to imagine a god who is somewhere out there okay in his throne in heaven decided to leave the throne just to wash your feet Literally. <laughs> Literally, but my brother, brothers and sisters, where can you find that kind of God? Like our God, who, who, who leave his throne, his, uh, the heaven, his, his throne of security and uh, power. And then he abandoned that for a moment just to come to you and even wash your feet. And then eventually, even ready to die for you on the cross. Only our Christian God. 
So purity is a gift. Oh, it's it's amazing that I I am member of this of this faith of this church, no? That I have a God who came down from his throne and come to me and ask me to wash my feet. It's just unthinkable. But the gesture itself is the proof. That's why I, I, I still feel uh, uh, sad that for of all the things that, that the Lord had done to humanity, why still a lot of people constantly reject or ignore Him? So what else you need that the Lord did not give? I don't know. Maybe that's really the attitude of humanity being ungrateful. No? Being ungrateful. Anyway. <laughs> that's the problem of the Lord. <laughs> so, third is, the gift is a purity that is an act of God. And it is, a, it's, it is a gift from the Lord. At the same time, aside from a gift, because it is freely given, we did not pay, it, pay to it, no? one dollar to be washed, no. <laughs> Sometimes you are even forced, give me your feet. <laughs> no. right? I mean, I like to dramatize things. No? Um, so that it's also very, very important and very useful when we use our imagination for good this time. Just use our imagination for good. <laughs> because sometimes we use our imagination for something that is bad. Okay? So imagine no? your God washing your feet. It is a gift because it is God who offered it freely. He did not ask us to, to pay or whatever. Even sometimes maybe forcing us just to wash our feet to prove that He really loves us as a gesture of His love. At the same time, it is a task. That's why. Uh, this, this, I think this is the application for us now. Knowing, it, knowing that it is a gift, at the same time, it is a task. Meaning to say, each one of us is expected to do the same. In what way? Later on. All right. This express exactly what is meant by I have given you an example. This is what Jesus told his disciples after washing their feet. This is what he said. I have given you an example. So meaning to say, it's not just purely a show that you have to Wow! Jesus was the feet of his disciples. Okay. Finish. No. <laughs> he said, I have given you an example. So meaning to say, we have to imitate him. Why? Because those whom he was their feet were disciples or believers. So if we are believers, we have to do the same way. He just showed us an example to be imitated. Give and a task. The new element or the newness of the commandment, okay, commandment, and the essence of Christianity is revealed in the saying, there you go, love as I have loved you. Again, this is Johannine, no, from St. John. Loving to the point of readiness to lay down one's life for the other. Because that's the fullness of expression of love. The other is the capacity to wash the feet of another. But the fullness of love is expressed and manifested when you lay down your life for the other. So there are, as we say, degrees of Loving service from the menial into the total, the washing of the feet and then laying on of one's life for one's friend. So, where the washing of the feet is leading us, mm. self giving. That's why, whenever we witness that washing of the feet, it's not just like a symbol kind of thing. I even remember one time I just heard, of course, we are not. <laughs> Uh, just an example. <laughs> I think it happened here a long time ago. 
instead of washing the feet, they perform the washing of hands. <laughs> I was, I was, oh, I, 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 good thing that I don't have a, I have no problem with my heart because I was maybe, uh, I was not. Uh, where in that world you you do that? There's you can't find that in in the Bible. <laughs> I don't know, but I just love. So they rather, instead of washing the feet, they do the washing of the hands. <laughs> I don't know, but what, what, what is the importance when you wash the hands? They can do that. <laughs> I said, I don't know, but it's funny, but I don't know. Don't, uh, please don't tell me. <laughs> don't tell that to someone <laughs> that I said this. Okay. <laughs> Uh, it's a funny thing, but um, wait, maybe for a good reason. I don't know. But I think if you don't want to to do to perform that the symbol of washing the hands, don't do it at all. <laughs> washing the hands. What's the significance of that? Anyway, <laughs> I, just, I don't know. It, it was really uh, it really happened, or it was just a joke. I'm not so sure. But I believe it, it really happened here. I don't know. <laughs> oh my God. Sorry, Lord. Okay. <laughs> so, loving to the point of readiness to lay down one's life for the other. Another element of gift and the task. The newness can come only from the gift of being with and being in. Christ. My brothers and sisters, especially young people, our our growth and fruitfulness in our Christian life can only be sustained or even excel if we keep on remaining or being in the Lord always. As what we heard in the parable, Without me, you can do nothing. That's why the connection of the disciple and Jesus is likened to the branch of the vine and the branches, the grape. The branch and the branches, uh, the, the vine and the branches. When you cut off the branches from the vine, it will die. The same thing with our relationship with Jesus. Only by remaining, by being with and being in Christ, we can truly be renewed and eventually bear much fruit likened to that branches connected to the vine. Okay? And also, by constantly remaining and being with, we are constantly cleansed. That's the importance of the sacrament of reconciliation, my friend. Only by letting ourselves be repeatedly cleansed not just once. Now, I just mentioned the sacrament of reconciliation. Maybe this is, you can relate to, to, to the common impression or feeling, no? That people, I don't know young people, how often do you go to confession? I'm not sure, but at least the church says once a year. At least <laughs> once a year, but in my experience being in the confessional box, oftentimes I encounter the penitent who've been away from confession for many years. Well, for valid reasons, of course. Being away, live on their own, uh, momentarily left the church or abandoned the faith, so on and so forth. So it's expected that like 10 years, 20 years, <laughs> imagine. <laughs> Well, we don't blame them for whatever reason they've been away. But you know, as a, as a Catholic, as a believer, as a disciple, we have to be constantly cleansed. That's why the Lord provided the sacrament of reconciliation. Because we know for sure, along the way, we would be always exposed to weakness and sinfulness. That's why I usually liken the confession to the bathroom. <laughs> the bathroom and confession, they are almost the same. 
Do you always complain? Oh, I don't want to go to the bathroom anymore. Because anyway, I will get sweat afterwards. So I don't want to take a bath anymore. You don't do that. <laughs> but why in confession, we always say, I don't want to confess anymore. I just, I keep on committing this sin, the same again and again. Well, it's logical. Once upon a time, I've been through that kind of struggle. Tempted always, I don't want to confess anymore. Because it's the same sin. So, where in the world you can find a new sin anyway? <laughs> right? <laughs> we are in the same world. We are the same human being. We are with the same witness. So, expect that, that we would always suffer and struggle with the same sin. It's like, after taking a bath, you will expose to the same environment. <laughs> right? So, you just automatically go to the bathroom at, at the end of the day to wash yourself to be refreshed again. The same thing with confession. Because according to this experience, we need to be always and constantly, repeatedly cleansed. That's why I sometimes think now, why we are tired of asking for forgiveness if we are not tired of committing mistake? <laughs> why we are ashamed to ask for forgiveness if in the first place we are not ashamed to commit sin? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with you? <laughs> All right? So, why not be even, even more grateful and even more, you know, uh, filled with blessing, with gratefulness and gratitude that, wow, uh, there is always an overwhelming forgiveness. It's like there is always a refreshing and overwhelming water in the faucet, in the shower room. You just enjoy it. Why not just enjoy it? But of course, I cannot blame you because sometimes I also feel that way, the same way. That I'm already like tired of, of going to confession, confessing the same sin. But at the end of the day, we have just to be grateful and just enjoy the forgiveness of the Lord. Like the way we enjoy the shower. <laughs> I mean, though sometimes... The, the faucet or the shower sometimes run out of water right? <laughs> for whatever reason. But you know, the forgiveness of the Lord in the sacrament is overflowing. <laughs> you just look for a priest. <laughs> okay. Anyway, it's, it's an amazing realization, right? Um, so it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That's why that's experience of St. Paul. Okay. When he drew closer to the Lord, he realized... How indeed so amazing to be in the road, to be with Christ. Okay? He was even capable of leaving his former belief, his allegiance to the law, and this time allegiance to Christ. So, uh, <laughs> it's a, sometimes it's, it's, it's really funny, no? Na, even our stories, our struggle and our journey as Christians, how about a funny moments, no? Many fun, funny uh, situations or instances in our life. But, you know, we are so grateful because the Lord did not abandon us. And hopefully, no matter how we struggle, we should not also abandon our faith. That all the more we have to persevere. So the new law is the grace of the Holy Spirit, not a new norm. But the new interiority granted by the Spirit of God Himself. That's why the, the role of the Spirit in us is, is constantly the one purifying our souls, our spirit. No? The Spirit of the Lord. Okay. To be a Christian is primarily a gift. Uh -huh. That's why I told you already, anything that is good is a gift. The only thing that we can claim as our own, you know what? Sin. <laughs> That's the only thing that we can own, that indeed God has no part in it. It is my own doing. Sin. But anything that is good belongs to the Lord. Even our very life, even our very self. Okay?
So our Christian faith is actually a gift. Though, of course, hey, Father, I decided to embrace it. Oh, yes. We said yes to it because we believe. Okay. We are almost, uh, <laughs> almost there. Hold on. Hold on, guys. Hold on. <laughs> uh, so the mystery of the betrayal. There is a betrayal. Well, you can you can you can exactly relate to it, but because not all of the disciples were really faithful, right? From time to time, there is a, a what we call betraying, betrayal of one's baptism, betrayal of one's promise. But it's part of human weakness. So the two different human responses to this gift in the person of Judas and Peter. Okay, first tragedy. Judas has become under the dominion of another. You know, after he received the morsel, he left. After receiving, they were already after this is already after the washing, they were already at, at the meal. Okay. After Jesus handed on the morsel, the piece of bread, he left. Imagine that can really happen, no? Although you are actively following the Lord, but anytime you can be under Satan as well. Imagine Peter, oh, Judas, was one of those you know, partaking the Last Supper of the Lord. Well, it is a mystery of sin. It is a mystery of, of weakness in the person of Judas. And sometimes when you hear Judas in the church, Okay, please don't leave the church just because of Judas. This is sometimes our, our tendency. Because of Judas, we criticize the church as if the church belongs only to Judas. Don't leave Jesus, don't leave the eleven just because of Judas. They were twelve, right? But I think it is illogical and it's not just if you abandon the group just only because of the mistake of one member. Mm -hmm. you, you get the point? The same thing with the church. We know that from time to time we, we see the character of Judas in the church. Maybe one of the priests, one of the bishops, I don't know. Or one of the lay members. But please, don't leave the church because of one Judas. Yeah, it's, easy. it's not easy, of course. True, the light shed by Jesus into Judas' soul was not completely extinguished. He does, not, he does take a step toward conversion. After he, he, he sold Jesus uh, out of 30 pieces of silver, Okay, he repented. That's why he, it is mentioned here. I have sinned. So the faith really was not totally extinguished, though the, Satan entered him after he left. But the problem is everything pure. No, it's not here. The, myth, the mystery of betrayal. The problem about Judas is this. You know the problem of Judas? Uh, after the betrayal, is that he can no longer believe in forgiveness. That's the problem. When someone lost hope and not anymore capable of admitting, that's the moment like what Jesus did. Judas' remorse turns into despair. That's why he hung himself. For those who come to this point, the, always, the, the situation of the person is always, the person is in depression, right? Depression. I think this is one of the issues and the problems in the world today. Depres depression. Lack, the loss of sense of hope. 
the the lack of of a, a perspective and a, an outlook in life that there is no more hope there is no more chance this is a character of judas actually his sin is lesser was lesser than the sin of peter but why he ended up that way because his remorse turned into despair and he no longer believed could no longer believe that he can be forgiven and so what what's your last last option end your life but in fact he could have been forgiven and sad to say there are people who, who end that way without even experiencing that there is actually so much hope and so much chances in life but because they isolated themselves you know the movement isolation to be on one's own and then it's like the pointing finger of satan the branches of the tree like like uh, um Judas was somehow being pointed by the branches of the tree that he is guilty of something or he has no other way, a chance but to hang himself. It's a mystery of, of weakness and sin and of the devil, no? Who already possessed Satan after he left. It's a sad thing. He could have been forgiven. So he shows us the wrong type of remorse. Hmm, wrong type of remorse. Judas, huh? The type that is unable to hope, that sees only its own darkness, the type that is destructive and in no way inauthentic. So we have the lesson here uh, in the person of Judas. Though his sin is not that serious compared to that of Peter, but because he was no, no longer able to see the hope or the forgiveness, so we end up that way. So John concludes that after receiving the morsel, he immediately went out, and it was night. So take note the the moment, no? It's night. So when everything to you is night, darkness, oh no. Judas goes out in a deep sense. He goes out into the night. He moves out of the light, who is Jesus, into darkness satan the power of darkness has taken hold of him mm -hmm. so the conversion of peter on the other hand okay this happened in on the last supper huh so after judas there goes peter like judas even those who have once been enlightened who have been tested the heavenly gift, the Eucharist, and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, can perish spiritually through a series of mm. seemingly small infidelities. That can happen, no? Small, small mistakes. We call it venial sins, no? But if it is frequent, it's like the... The dirt, no, that constantly uh, pouring on us, and eventually it becomes no, a, a serious and a big uh, amount of guilt or sin. Ultimately, passing from the light into the night, where they are no longer capable of conversion. So the tendency, also, my dear brothers and sisters, is this: we should not belittle that, like. You know, underestimate. Well, anyway, Father, it's just a venial, um, small infidelities anyway. <laughs> Something like that. But, you know, if we constantly do that, we will end up and no longer capable of returning. Because we are already used to it. <laughs> you know, anything that is wrong, when it becomes a habit, eventually it becomes right. <laughs> it becomes okay. You know, Satan is really cunning, no? So to conversion of Peter, another danger is seen in Peter, two, two aspects of danger. Peter does not want to have his feet washed by Jesus. Second, his despair to rush in 
his heroism leads to his denial. There is also a danger to that character of Peter. So much so that because you never really reflected on it, you just, because out of compulsion of passion, you just, okay, let's go with the Lord. <laughs> Isn't it? that? That's why he even uh, struck the, the air of the soldier when Jesus was about to be arrested in Gethsemane with his sword. But eventually, when, during the trial, he renounced Jesus. He denied him. Okay? So that's the, the inconsistency of Peter as well. Okay? Peter must learn that even martyrdom is no heroism achievement. Rather, it is a grace to be able to suffer for Jesus. He must learn how to wait. Mm. Wait. <laughs> it's almost done joke. So we have to wait. He must learn how to wait, how to persevere. So my dear brothers and sisters, the secret is this. We may stumble and fall. We may commit mistakes. We may suffer a lot. But we have to wait for the right time and we have to persevere. Those who wait are the ones who succeed. Those who have perseverance and patience are those who succeed. That's why even in your studies, if you persevere, keep on trying, giving your best, you will eventually succeed. The same thing with faith. Because there is no shortcut in anything. There is no shortcut to graduate. There is no shortcut to heaven. But through suffering with Jesus. Through perseverance. So the two exchanges are essential about the same thing. Not telling God what to do, but learning to accept Him as He reveals Himself to us. Sometimes we dictate. We rather dictate, Lord, I think your, your idea is not really effective. I have a be the best suggestion. This is also the tendency of Peter. When Peter interrupted Jesus, uh, what's that? And uh, Caesarea Philippi, when Jesus when he interrupted, it must not happen to you, Lord, because Jesus said, "We will go to Jerusalem. To Jerusalem, there I will, uh, I will be arrested, suffered, and be killed." And Peter interrupted, "Oops, Lord, come to me, please listen to me." <laughs> Something. Like it must not happen to you. See, all right. So sometimes our idea must be purified by the by the teachings and the the words of Jesus. So the washing of the feet and confession of sin, the love of Jesus is our true bath of purification. So the complete bath is granted through baptism. We become Christians not through our own doing, but through the gift of God. Yet in the life of Christians, for table fellowship with our Lord, it constantly requires completion. What is that? Washing of feet. That's why I said a while ago that from the start of the Mass, there is what we call examination of conscience or asking for forgiveness from the Lord. Through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. For us to be worthy to partake the Eucharist. Constant. Okay? So since even the baptized remain sinners because of our choices every day, they need confession of sins which cleanses us for all unrighteousness. That's why that how we badly need confession. The same thing like how we badly need the, the bathroom. In the context of our Christian cleanness or holiness. Now, from time to time, we need... Of course, I'm not saying that we have to confess every day. <laughs> we are not saying that. But whenever we feel that we are guilty of something, that we feel that we are dirty inside, we need to be washed by that sacrament. The same thing, whenever we feel uncomfortable, we go to the bathroom and take a shower. All right? So the point is this. Guilt must not be allowed to foster... In the silence of the soul, poisoning it from within, it needs to be confessed. So, my dear brothers and sisters, that's why don't ever, ever uh, let that sin or guilt remain or stay long in us. We need to confess that as soon as possible. Because later on, uh, we just like 
well, it's no longer so strong. So I just keep it to myself. <laughs> Something like that. So we have to really make sure that it is cleansed. No? And we should not justify anything. Well, hey, the parish father is far here and uh, the priest is not always available anyway. So many excuses and everything. All right. So the last part. The washing of the feet, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, as the kind of Christian service is that it, it shows us the necessity or the needs of being cleansed. Washing of the feet, of the feet cleanses us. It forgives and reconciles us. It restores us once again. Because from time to time, we are lost, okay? We are astray, and we need to be back again and again. It makes us worthy to partake at table. That's why there is always uh, being, being clarified that if we are guilty of a mortal sin, you should not receive communion, right? If you are not feel worthy to receive the Lord, don't do so. Confess first. That's the point of it. To make us worthy to partake a table fellowship. That's why before they took the table, they ate to be Jesus, they were first washed. He washed them first. And finally, it saves. So we have seen the, the theology of the washing of the feet as the foundation of Christian service and love shown to us by the Lord himself. Thank you very much. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> finished. It is finished. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much, my dear brothers and sisters, for uh, coming us today and joining with it, uh, in our program. And so we conclude with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you always. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, my dear brothers and sisters. God bless you. you. Alright. Put the tables back? Uh, no need, sir. No need. Just let it live that way. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure.